Um, and I think that should always be like the default, like we should all be always aiming for readability because that's, you know, a drive to share your code and all. So you don't only want code that's readable for yourself, you also want code that's readable for others. Um, also in terms of speed, um, what should you be optimizing? You probably need to profile your code to find where the bottlenecks are. You can't be optimizing, you know, every single um, loop that you have. Uh, and the bigger question is whether you should even be optimizing at all. So um, I think in computer science, there's this quite famous quote by Donna, Donna Neuf uh, that, um, that's warning against premature optimization. So a lot of times, the time you would need to spend in optimizing your code might not be justifiable. So the takeaway is to always first make your code work correctly and then think about whether, you know, you really need to optimize your code to make it run faster. And in the case when you do, um, then you can use some of this sort of um, examples that I showed you today. Um, so that's all I have uh, for my presentation. If there's any questions, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Miyun. Um, I think there was uh, some discussion in the chat about when you first show us, showed us the L apply function uh, and uh, the fact that it returns a list. And then um, some people commented that actually, if you want to return not a list, but a, a, a matrix or a, or, or a scalar, you can use S apply, I think. Yeah. Or you can just unlist it and you yes. know, combine it somehow. Yep. Is there any any more comments or, or another question at this stage? Let me and just one question about implementing loops in C versus using Lapply. You said that Lapply is using C for the underlying loop, and it doesn't seem to give much saving in terms of time. But when you implemented the loop yourself in C, it did give quite a good saving. Does that mean that the C that's used for the apply function isn't very efficient? Um, so I think. Um, so like obviously with the vectorization as well, like vectorized operations, everything is being passed into C, but I think it's at what stage you start passing things into C. I'm, so I know with like vectorized um, operations, um, everything you want to operate on, so um, the vector itself is being passed into C and everything just happens within C. But I think in L apply, some of the initial calculations are still being done in R. I mean, I'm not sure exactly at which stage um, uh, the function, I mean, at which stage the um, information is being passed on to C, but I think that's why you're not seeing the same kind of time saving. And um, I think if you read into um, like Hadley Wickham's book, he does warn against the fact that um, L apply, the apply family is quite easily misunderstood. Um, the sort of whole idea behind it is to improve um, the readability and to sort of um, make sure you don't get the um, some of these um, errors where you're accidentally modifying your variables and stuff. Um, it's not really to be um, used for speeding up your code. And I think another important you. point which you've mentioned sometimes you don't really get like a massive boost uh, in, in, in speed in running the code by doing this, well, tricks, I guess, or, or fiddling with the code. So there's a, again, perhaps a trade-off in readability, knowing what the code does. So maybe this is a process where you get to at the nth iteration where you're very solid about what the code actually does, then you start uh, making it faster and, and sometimes the gains are even marginal. There are quite a few like tutorials on parallelization online and I think come across one where there's quite a good example of um, where he changes the code, he parallelizes the code where you think it'll be slowest, but actually it doesn't give you much savings. Mm. So I think profiling of code is quite important because sometimes the bottleneck is not where you think it is at. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. So I think that's our last presentation of the day is uh, Seamus Kent from NICE, and he's going to talk about generating HTA evidence using the OMOP common data model and standardized analytical tools. So Gianluca, if we can give access to 
Seamus? I think you already have access now. I'm just giving it to you. Seamus, can you talk? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to share a screen. My PowerPoint isn't showing on my options of the windows to show, but... Um, I think if you click more in the bottom right or all options, it only shows a selection. Okay, I have share on the bottom right. I don't have a an option for um, more. Let me try again. I mean, option is you could send me your slide and I could share. Yeah, let me, if I just share the screen, I'll see whether, see at the moment you can see a kind of a Chrome thing, is that right? Yeah, we can see Chrome. And can you, can you now see um, a PowerPoint? No. No. We can okay. see that you're trying to flip through different screens or yeah because I, I the demonstration is on a, a remote desktop and it's um uh, and my powerpoint's not but <laughs> i can can i can i send it through to you yeah so, sure and then I... okay sorry about that i guess just while we're waiting one point that, that hackathon we were with me when we were trying to make R code much faster, we did compare it to Excel, and the obviously R was much, much faster, but we did pass the Excel on to some Excel experts and they were able to accelerate the implementation of Excel by a factor of about 10 or 100 as well. So optimization is uh, across packages. It's, it's a uniform thing which they need to do. Yeah, it always boils down to, you know, knowing what, you, what you're actually doing, right? So if you do know what you're doing, things will most likely be better than if you don't. Hi, how did you get the uh, email with the PowerPoint? Yes, I did. I'm just saving it somewhere. Okay, it should be shared now. Yeah, all right, thank you very much, Howard. Yeah, sorry about that slightly slow start. I've had a lot of bad luck this week with um, doing presentations on Zoom, so it could, it could be my fault. Um, yes, yeah, so, I'm, I, as, uh, as Howard said, I'm Seamus, I'm from NICE, um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the work NICE does in uh, we're working on technology guidance and uh, providing clinical and other guidelines. But as well as that, NICE is part of various uh, international research initiatives, looking at various sort of emerging themes and challenges which NICE may face in the future related to new types of technologies or new types of data analytics. And one of these projects is called EDEN, and the aim of this is to create a federated data network of healthcare data sets in Europe that conform to a common data model. And if you're anything like me, when I first worked on this project, this might be a bit impenetrable, but I'll try and explain what this is, why it might be useful uh, before going into the live demonstration. So yeah, could you move to the next slide, please, Howard? Yeah, so um, as, as I'm sure you're all aware the evidence requirements for HTA are vast. We look at a large number of different parameters in our assessments, uh, whether kind of independently or as part of economic models. And if you think of it from the perspective of a, say a pharmaceutical developer who is trying to get access to markets across Europe, they need to provide evidence that's relevant to that local market. 
Um, so this creates a challenge. It's difficult to generate um, all, all that evidence and no single data set is often going to be sufficient. So there's value in using multiple databases. Um, so this is in this case of, as I say, you know, not, no single data source will contain everything you need. You might need to translate results across patient populations or settings. Or in some cases, multi-database studies might be useful because you need to enhance power. So in the case of rare diseases, it's important to kind of collaborate um, across countries and organizations to get sufficient cases to understand, um, say, comparative effectiveness. You might also want to explore heterogeneity and perform kind of validation exercises. Um, but this is often challenging to actually undertake multi-database studies. And this is for a number of reasons. It might be difficult to identify appropriate data. Um, sort of, uh, sorry, the sort of data registries aren't very good. They don't really have much metadata available. Um, and it can be very difficult to then access data because of governance constraints or capacity issues. Um, um, allied to this, we have a, a problem, uh, certainly from the perspective of HTA bodies, there's often a worry about the quality uh, of analyses from real world data sets, both due to the quality of that data itself, but also due to uh, perceived lack of transparency in the way that the, the data is collected, manipulated, and how the studies, how the analysis is actually undertaken. Um, and then perhaps most importantly in the context of these common data models is that the data is often fragmented, healthcare data, and interoperability is poor. So data sets vary substantially in terms of their structure, their content, the terminologies they use to describe uh, clinical and health system data. And this put, imposes a burden on analysis and those reviewing evidence like KHDA bodies who need to understand the idiosyncrasies of these different data sets and their coding systems. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, so common data models are a solution or a potential solution to many of these issues. What they do is they standardize the structure and the representation of data that is uh, mapping various different uh, clinical diagnosis languages to a common standard. Uh, and this renders them interoperable. And what that means is that we can create a common analytical code sometimes using standardized tools, and then apply this across a data network. Um, in a federated or a distributed data network, we don't share data between organizations, data remains with the local uh, data holders, and we just share code across that network. And this overcomes some of those governance challenges I mentioned. Now, um, these aren't very well known in the sort of HTA world, uh, but they are, quite commonly used now in regulatory context. So the FDA has something called the Sentinel system, which it uses um, traditionally for safety surveillance, but it's also started to use it a little bit for comparative effectiveness, effectiveness estimation. Um, and this represents the origins of these common data models in, in, in sort of regulatory safety surveillance contexts. Uh, the European Medicines Agency is now uh, looking quite closely into their use. So for those who follow it, they recently released their big data task force recommendations. And the main one is to create a data network infrastructure based on a, a common data model framework. And they're also working with Eden um, to understand the safety and effectiveness of medicines in COVID-19. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go into detail here about the Eden um, or Odyssey, which is the kind of, Eden is the European arm, Odyssey is the sort of global organization who, um, who created the common data model and manage it. Um, they're an open science community um, and anyone can join and, and contribute. Um, so the, on the left-hand side, we have a representation of the common data model but that's not particularly important for what I'm going to demonstrate today. What is important is the range of tools that are available to actually interact with this data. And if you can go on to the next uh, slide. Yeah, so there are a large number of tools that have been developed, standardized open source tools, which are available through the GitHub uh, channel. And these are predominantly 
uh, created at the moment to do three main things. One is to undertake characterization studies. So this is understanding uh, characteristics of populations who, or who you know, are exposed to a particular drug or device or have a particular outcome, as well as looking at the occurrence of outcomes over time for these cohorts. The second is population level estimation. And as I say, this is largely being built around safety surveillance and has various sort of large scale high, or sometimes called high density propensity score matching facilities within it. Uh, but it's increasingly being used for comparative effectiveness estimation. And then finally, patient level prediction. But they also have created several dashboards which help understand data and build models. So one is a data quality assessment. As I said, a, a common challenge in using observational data is a lack of clear information about its quality. So the data quality dashboard will provide you information about the completeness um, and consistency of different data items. Um, Yeah, and there, there's other there are other dashboards to kind of look at modeling assumption, and explore results. So if you can move on to the the next slide. So there's a few different ways of actually undertaking analysis within within this framework, and I'm going to go through these and particularly looking at their interaction with R. So at this point, I can leave the PowerPoint and share my own screen to the remote desk remote desktop. Okay, so can you now see the remote desktop? Yes. Yes, fantastic. Okay, so the first way that um, you can actually use this dashboard is through a user interface. I'm not going to talk about this much, but this allows you to define cohorts, uh, concept sets, and your estimation structure so you're defining your target comparative cohorts and your outcomes uh, in this case also negative controls and then your analysis which here is a frequency score matching time to event outcome data and this will actually provide um, a full R package which you can download I have uh, one loaded up already and then you download that you open it And all you have to do then is specify your, uh, tell, tell R where your database is stored and how you can access it. And then you can just execute the file. And this will produce the results for your analysis as specified uh, within, within that program. And the reason it looks like this is because you can apply this or you can send out the script to several different databases who are in the network. They'll just have to update this with their, their connection details and then run the results. Uh, when they do that, so across the data network, you'll end up with um, something which looks like this. This is this is one of the dashboards I was talking about, uh, a shiny app essentially. Uh, here is a paper that was done through this network um, in the early stages of the, the pandemic, um, and that, that paper is available if people want to read more about the method in Lancet Rheumatology last month. Um, and just to give a, a kind of taste of what this can do, so if I look at CPRD data, um, we can look at that this is, this is all created through that, that program that I showed you. Uh, it shows you the initial cohort who left the cohort for what reasons. You can look at the distribution of propensity scores for your target and comparative cohorts. You can assess covariate balance. Um, and yeah, uh, look at your characteristics of your population, both before and after propensity score adjustments. Uh, it's not loading up in sufficient time for me to show you there, but you can imagine what it would look like. Um, and then you can you can also look at the the Kaplan Meier curve, and you can also look at the meta analysis analyst results as well. Um, I don't want to go into any detail on this really, it's just to give you a flavour of, of this. The potential advantage of this from a HGA body is that it can be quite transparent, it allows us to really 
look in and explore the data and ensure that, for example, balance is achieved in the propensity scores and that uh, various sensitivity analysis can also be presented alongside the, the main results. Um, 